morning, church. Take your Bibles, open up to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32, if you do not have a Bible, you might be able to find a Bible in a seat underneath of you, and in that Bible, it's on page 173. Deuteronomy chapter 32, as you're looking there, I just want to uh, remind you about our night of prayer and worship tonight at Forward Kitchener. Uh, I hope to see many of you there tonight. I can't think of a better place for us to gather as a church to pray about Uh, what it means to be a multiplying church than to go to the place that is part of our history as a church and being a multiplying church, that God used Forward Cambridge to uh, start and multiply out Forward Kitchener a number of years ago. And so we want to gather there as one church body from all of our different sites to pray together and to worship together as we seek God's will uh, for us as a church in the days ahead. All right, how do you tend to respond to something that is unfair in life? Now, I know that there seems to be a lot of things that are unfair in life, and sometimes it's hard to really keep up with it. So for most of us, uh, our, our general response is we will kind of ignore it unless, unless something unfair happens to us. If something unfair happens to us or if something unfair happens to people that we love and care about, or maybe there's a cause in the world that you're really passionate about and something unfair happens there, then we tend to have a little bit more of a reaction. There's something inside of us that gets stirred up that says, somebody needs to do something about this. A couple of months ago, I was shockingly attending a Blue Jays game. And, uh, and while we were in Toronto at the Jays game, after the game was over, Uh, I was at a stoplight getting ready to turn left to jump onto the Gardner Expressway. And uh, I had an advance green to turn left to get onto the Gardner. And so I turned left to get onto the Gardner. I was there with my wife and some of my family. And just as I turned left to get onto the Gardner, there's a person on the other side of the stoplight who turns right and cuts right in front of me. I slam on my brake in the middle of the intersection, and there was something, a dark side of me, that started to come out. And immediately, as soon as that dark side of me came out, I did what any sane person would do in a moment like that, and I just slammed on the horn of my car, trying to get the attention. This person could have caused an accident with my family in it. Even worse, they're actually ahead of me now, trying to get onto the gardener. My competitive juices are flowing. So I slam on my horn, and I thought, you know, we're all nice Canadians. They will just, like, roll down their window, recognize their mistake, and wave their hand and apologize. And sure enough, they rolled down their window, and sure enough, they put their hand out, but it wasn't their whole hand they were sticking out of the window. Well, that got me going even a little bit more, and so I honked on my horn again, and they waved at me again for some reason. And back and forth we went a few times over, and my wife is now getting really agitated with me because of what I'm doing in that moment. And, I, and I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, but there's injustice that's been committed against me, and I need to do this. And she was worried we were going to get into a road rage incident. I was more thinking, man, I hope this person isn't from our church. What is it about us that just feels the need for justice when a wrong has been committed? Well, I've got good news for you today. I think that we feel the need for justice because we are image bearers of a God who loves justice. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 that you are made in the image of God. And then in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 8, we read these words, I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and injustice. That whenever there's something inside of you that rises up and says, that's just wrong, somebody needs to do something about it. When that happens, there's something in that need for justice in your heart that is reflecting God and God's love for justice in the world. It's good when things that are wrong bug you and agitate you. Yesterday we had Remembrance Day. It's good 
that part of our heritage as a nation and as a people is that we had generations who were bothered by things like the rise of Hitler and the injustices that were being committed against millions of people in the world. It's good that you have the same desire for justice in many other parts of the world and other situations that exist today. It's good when it bothers you uh, when people are treating others unfairly, including when people treat you unfairly. It's good because it's a glimpse of the image of God that is in you, a God who loves justice and hates injustice. But there is a difference between you and God when it comes to this topic of justice. See, God alone can give out perfect justice because God alone is perfectly just. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, uh, I actually want to start reading at the very end of chapter 31, the last verse, verse 30. It says, Then Moses spoke the words of this song until they were finished, in the ears of all the assembly of Israel. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. And let the earth hear the words of my mouth. My, may my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass, and like showers upon the herb. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord and ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. They have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. Do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you, who made you, and established you? For God, justice is not just something he does. Justice is who he is. In Deuteronomy 32, the verses we just read, it's called the Song of Moses. It's Moses' farewell address to the nation and the people of Israel. And it's called the Song of Moses because it's written in poetry. It's written in the style of a song. God wanted the people of Israel to learn something, and they wanted to, he wanted them to learn it so that they could pass it down from one generation to the next in an easy format. So they learn and develop this song to pass down this important lesson for them to learn. And the starting point of this song of Moses is a desire for people to see how God is great and worth being worshipped. And so as we start the message today, let me just say this. Going through this entire series on attributes of God and who God is, we don't want you just to have a bunch of more facts about who God is. It, like, if you, at the end of the series, walk around and think to yourself, well, I've got some more good information about God, then something, there's a disconnect somewhere here in this series. Because our greatest desire is that as you gain information about who God is, that your heart, your love for God will grow stronger and stronger, that you will see the magnificence of this God that we worship every single Sunday in fresh and new ways that will bring some... When you sing songs about God, you're not just going through the motions, but you are at a heart level connecting with how good he is. When you're talking about God through the week, that it's not just going through the motions and an intellectual exercise, but it is something that is bringing life to your soul. And in this farewell address, the first thing that Moses wants the people to know about God is that God is the rock. He is the standard. He's the standard that everything else should be compared against. That everything God does is right. It, this is where the idea of justice comes from. That God is a God who always is right and he always does what is right. God giving out perfect justice is not just an action he takes. God giving out perfect justice is who he is. He is perfectly just, and you'll see words like righteous, righteous and just, side by side with each other. God is perfectly righteous, which means he is perfectly just. Now, I know as soon as I say that everything God does is right and just, that doesn't sit well with some people. I know that there are people who will struggle with some questions, like, like if God's perfectly just, then why is it 
that some people seem to be able to get away with some terrible things. Write down this passage of Scripture. We're not going to open to it, but write this down if you're taking notes. Colossians chapter 3, verse 25. The Bible says this, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. And there is no partiality with God. See, as humans, our tendency is to forget that God is just. We we love the idea that God is loving. We love the idea that God is kind and merciful and good and faithful and all those positive things. But we often and easily forget that God is just. And as a matter of fact, if you were to read all of Deuteronomy 32, the entire point of the whole chapter and the entire point of the Song of Moses is to remind people that God is just. Because when people forget that God is just, people live like they can get away with anything they want to get away with. David Strain described it like this. He said, when we confess that God is infinitely, eternally, and unchangeably just, we're saying that God never looks the other way. God never winks at sin. He never excuses wickedness. So what looks like people getting away with injustice is actually, in our time, in our reality, a temporary situation. With God, justice will always come. Some people might say, well, but if God's perfectly just, why does he seem to allow some things that don't seem fair? Or even worse, why does he seem to cause some things that don't seem fair? Look at verse 6 for a minute in Deuteronomy 32. In verse 6, there's a distinction that's made between us and and God. Right at the very end of verse 6. Is he not your father who created you? It's important for us to remember there's a distinction between us and God. God is the creator. We are the created. And this is where when we have a question like why does God seem to allow things or do things that don't seem fair, this is where we need to come back and remind ourselves about the other character traits of God. That if God is omniscient, like we talked about last week, then God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts are. There are things that God knows that you and I simply do not know or understand yet. Because he is the creator and we are the created. It's where reminding ourselves of God's omnipotence matters. Because God is more powerful than anyone who appears like they're using their power to create injustice against other people. And because God is just and God loves justice, we can count on the fact that all wrongs will be made right. God is just, but as people, we're, we're different. We, we love justice, but we're not perfectly just. Moses compares God in verse 4 to people in verse 5. In verse 5, he says, At best, people are imperfect. At worst, we're completely crooked. That no matter how hard you and I try, it is impossible for you to be perfectly just because your life has been shaped by circumstances, experiences, injustices committed against you and against people you love. Your life has had all kinds of things that you've learned from other people who are imperfect people, who have taught you things, and all those things have shaped who you are today. Your personality adds into that, and you put all those things together, and it is impossible for you or I to be perfectly just as people. You're you're probably familiar with Lady Justice. I'm going to put a picture up on the screen. Lady Justice is always seen as holding the scales of justice in her hands, and the scales of justice represent weighing facts and evidence in order to determine a verdict. And the scales represent the duty of Lady Justice to restore balance to society. She is meant to be completely impartial. What you may not know is the origin of Lady Justice. Lady Justice came from the goddess of justice in Roman mythology. And for Romans, 
justice was a high value. In fact, many of the emperors, and uh, like Augustus, for instance, often celebrated justice as being one of their virtues, one of the things that they always aspired towards and believed that they had a standard of justice that was higher and greater than anybody else's standard of justice. In fact, for Romans, they believed that their standard of justice was so perfect, it is what justified them going and conquering the known world at that time. But there's such a paradox there, isn't there? Because the Roman Empire convinced itself, we're the ones who have the corner on justice. And at the very same time, to live out that justice relied, uh, meant relying on violence towards slaves and conquered people, including some of our history as Christians, who had so many Christians die at the hands of, Ro- of the Roman Empire simply because of our faith in Jesus. You see, even those who commit themselves to justice the most are often blind to their own sense of injustice. Now, before you start thinking about your least favorite political party or political leader and say he should be listening to this sermon right now, or before you start thinking about the social justice cause that drives you crazy because you see people who are are creating more injustice in the world as they respond to injustice, I want you to stop and look in the mirror. One of the real dangers with becoming people who are committed to seeking justice for wrongs committed is that we can end up using that as an excuse to commit injustice against other people. On May 31st, 2009, confessing Christian Scott Roeder followed George Tiller to church one Sunday. George Tiller was on his way to the Reformation Lutheran Church where he served as an usher. And before George Tiller got to church that Sunday, Scott Roeder shot and killed him. Why? Because George Tiller was an abortion doctor. And Scott Roeder convinced himself that he was carrying out justice for God and for these children by killing this abortion doctor. Now, I I know that that seems like an extreme example, but I also know that we all have our own blind spots. One person's sin against you does not give you permission to sin against someone else. Getting cut off in traffic does not give you permission for road rage. But this kind of thing happens all the time in our world. One injustice takes place, and we push back, and we create another injustice. And the cycle goes round and around and around. And some of you are caught in that cycle yourselves. Some of you, even in your own families, you're caught in that cycle. Think about the person that you have conflict with. You have conflict with that person. They do something that hurts you and wounds you deeply. And so your response is, how do I get even with that person? How how do I give them the silent treatment? How do I talk about them to others in such a way that I'm going to put them down in front of other people? Now, you might be feeling to yourself, "But, but I'm justified in my actions. I'm justified in my response, and they're the ones who created the injustice. But like my mom used to say to me, she said, Kirk, two wrongs don't make a right. And the entire song of Moses is a warning to all of us. Always remember, God is just, and God will carry out justice. You cannot get away with any sin that you commit against another person or against God. And if the truth be told, all of us have done something unjust to someone, and we deserve justice to be carried out against us. You see, every person likes the idea of justice until it needs to be carried out against you. Then you want mercy. If you've ever been pulled over for a speeding ticket, then you know that moment where, yeah, I'm guilty, they got me. And you know that as that police officer is walking up to the car with your speeding ticket in hand, you're sitting there thinking to yourself, 
man, I hope they don't find me or give me as many points as I deserve. You know instantly that there's something inside you that just wants a sense of mercy from the police officer. And all of us know that none of us is perfect. Like, like I think we can all settle on that, right? Like, there's not one person who's perfect. But the Bible tells us more than that. To not be perfect means that all have sinned. And the Bible says the wages, the penalty, the price for your sin is death. That justice for your sin and my sin is the death penalty. Complete and final judgment from God. That's what God has determined is just. Now, you don't have to like what a law says, but it doesn't change what the law says. And because God is just, God must follow through on what he has said. And God has weighed the evidence and you and I have been found guilty before a holy God. And when you know you're guilty, and you know what the consequences are, there kind of tends to be two responses. The first response is, how do I justify my actions? How do I kind of squeeze my way out of this? Or there's the other response where you can just hope for mercy. And the good news is this, God is just, but he is also merciful. And this is where Jesus Christ, the Son of God, enters into the scene of our lives. Listen to what it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Another way of putting it, Christ suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. This incredible, glorious reality that though we deserve justice, Jesus goes to the cross and takes the penalty on your behalf. That God is perfectly just, and so justice must be carried out, but God, in his mercy, decides to carry it out himself so that you don't have to. The, the great reality that faces every human being is this. Justice will be carried out. The only question is whether or not God's justice will be carried out against you or whether or not you will trust what Jesus has done on your behalf and accept the fact that justice has been carried out by him for you. God's justice is satisfied by Jesus and everyone who puts their faith in Jesus is declared not guilty by God. See, God doesn't just lower the charges against you. God removes the charges against you because Jesus paid the price for you. God declares you to be not guilty, and he declares you to be righteous. And in the Bible, that's called justification. And if you have never put your faith in Jesus, if you are not a follower and believer of Jesus today, then I am simply inviting you to trust Jesus with your life literally with your life. To turn to him, to understand that God is just, but he's merciful and he's calling you and he wants to forgive you of the injustice you've committed. And this is where many of us like to leave this story because it's a feel-good moment, because we've received God's mercy in our lives. But God's mercy in your life is never meant to end with just saying, oh man, I'm so glad Jesus loves me. God's mercy in your life is always meant to stir you up and move you towards good works. That's what Ephesians 2.10 teaches us. You are an ambassador on this earth for a God who loves justice. And because God is just, you should seek justice for others. You know, there's a lot of things that people think about when it comes to how do you honor God with your life. You'll think about, I sing songs, and I pray, and I read my Bible, and I'm nice to people, and you've got all kinds of things that you think about when it comes to honoring God with your life. But one of the themes in the Bible of what it looks like to honor God with your life is to be someone who is seeking justice for others. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17, God says this, Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. 
Somewhere along the way, justice became a thing that we didn't really talk about in evangelical churches. Growing up as a kid, for me, in, in an evangelical church, I, I was always told, ah, those churches that are talking about a social gospel and social justice, they've, they're left-leaning and, and, and they're not really preaching the real gospel. And, and today even, in evangelical churches, and maybe even in some of your conversations, you'll look at different justice issues and you'll use words like, ah, those people, they're all just woke. And most of us don't even know what the word woke means when we say it. It's just a buzzword that we've picked up on. And you can determine, and you can decide to put whatever labels you want to put on things. But the one thing I can tell you with absolute certainty is that the label God puts on justice is that it's a command from him to his people. We are called by God to be his ambassadors here on earth to seek justice for others. So when we see justice in the Bible, what does that even mean? What does that look like? So let me give you a few different meanings of justice. It means to treat people equitably. It it means it doesn't matter the color of your skin or your intelligence or your abilities or the level of your income or whether you are from Galt, Preston, or Hespler. (laughs) We treat everyone equitably. Justice means, uh, there's another word that can be translated as Justice, and it's this, righteous, that it refers to a life of right relationships with each other, that we conduct all of our relationships in family and in society with a sense of fairness and generosity and equity towards each other. If you are in an abusive relationship, you are experiencing injustice. Leave, go, get someone to help you. If you are abusing someone, You are being unjust towards that person. If you see someone being treated poorly at all by someone, justice stands up and seeks to make things right for them. Justice biblically means giving people exactly what they are due. Whether that's care or protection or, yes, even punishment. Justice means give people what they are due. When someone sins or breaks the rules, justice says there should be a penalty. When someone's fearful for their life or their safety, justice says protect them. The Bible most often refers to the need to seek justice for people who are experiencing oppression, the fatherless, the poor, the widows, those who are hungry. In fact, when Jesus is seen as getting angry in the Gospels, Most often, it was primarily over justice issues because people were using power to oppress others, either financially or in terms of creating extra layers of religious rules. And one of the things I love about our church, and I'm so grateful for about our church, is the commitment of so many of you to seek justice for others. A few weeks ago, we did a spiritual health survey, and about half of our church is involved in volunteering for organizations outside of our church. And many of those organizations are doing things that are seeking justice for others in the name of Jesus. Some of you are heavily invested in seeking justice for kids and youth in our community, whether that's through safe families or through fostering children and adopting children, whether it's serving kids in our youth ministry or kids ministry. Some of you are invested in things like how do we help people who are fleeing war in their homeland to find a place to live? That is a justice issue for people. Serving the homeless, helping people with affordable housing, fighting against human sex trafficking, and I could go on and on and on about all the ways so many of you are invested and involved in justice issues. In fact, I've had people in our community tell me that they don't know where their work would be if it weren't for people from Forward Church who were serving and investing in these kinds of causes. And I am so grateful for that. But even as you and I seek justice for others, God has placed boundaries on the level of justice that we can personally seek, right? Like, you can't just go and murder someone because they're murdering people. You, You can't just go and drag someone's name through the mud 
because of their injustice. You can't yell and scream or have bitterness in your heart when God says do everything with humility and gentleness. And so what God has done is God goes and God creates civil authority and he gives to civil authority and civil authority leaders the responsibility to create systems of justice in a nation. Proverbs 29.4 tells us, by justice a king builds up the land. And so there are times where seeking justice means that we are going to access the civil authorities to do the work of carrying out justice. But we all know that there are times that that even doesn't work, right? So what do you do? What do you do when you're trying to seek justice for others, but nothing seems to be happening? What do you do when you're the one who's experiencing injustice and nothing seems to be happening? See, the great temptation that you will face is to take matters into your own hands and to create your own sense of justice. God isn't coming through. Nothing's changing in the circumstance, so I need to do something more. But Romans chapter 12, verse 19 tells us this, that you can trust God to carry out justice for you. Listen to what it says in Romans 12, verse 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. But leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. There are some of you watching online or here in the room today, you've experienced a lot of personal injustices in your life. Things have happened against you that should never happen against you. And maybe you've got some anger or you've got some wounds that are still there or you've got some bitterness in your heart towards people. And I want you to know this. Like the God of the universe who knows everything, he sees your pain, he sees your hurt, and he doesn't want you to become overwhelmed with the burden of carrying this on your shoulders yourself. He doesn't want you to be overwhelmed with bitterness and anger in your own heart and the emotional and physical toll that that takes on you. That there's a better way than what you're carrying right now. The God of the universe wants you to know that whatever injustice has been carried out against you, he will make sure that justice is served. Some of you are carrying a lot of stress right now because you feel the weight of so many injustices in the world. It, whether they're injustices that have been done to you or things that you're seeing happen in the world and it just feels so overwhelming right now. And, and maybe you're even trying to seek justice for other people, but it just feels like this is going nowhere. It feels heavy and you feel powerless to do anything with it. Here's what you can do. Trust God to be just. He has promised he will make sure justice is carried out. If God is just, if God hates injustice, if God promises that the wrongdoer will be paid back, you and I, we can save ourselves a ton of emotional and relational pain by trusting God to be and do what he says he's going to do. Because God's version of justice is far greater than any version of justice you or I could ever come up with. And you might go, but Kirk, like, that sounds nice, but how do I know that God's actually going to carry out justice? Because there's this part of me that's still not really sure. I want you to turn to the very last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 15. If you have one of the Bibles in your seats, uh, it's on page 1036. Now, I'm not going to get into all the debates of everything that Revelation means, but in Revelation chapter 15, 
we have this incredible picture of something that's going to happen. That every believer in Jesus is gathered together. And look what we're going to do beginning of verse 3 of Revelation 15. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed. The song of Moses is not just for the Israelites thousands of years ago. The song of Moses is for all of us who are believers in Jesus to declare that our God is just and our God will carry out justice in this world. The rest of Revelation 15 starts to unfold a picture and John's given a vision of things that happen after they worship God in this way, after they declare the song of Moses, and the rest of Revelation 15 starts to paint this picture, and it builds on and on about how God's justice starts to unfold in the world. And there's so many good things that happen because God carries out justice. It is a promise to us. Friends, as sure as I am standing here in front of you today, I can say with 100% confidence there is coming a day when God is going to make everything right. Everything. There is going to be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, no more injustice, no more kids being abused, no more sexual assault, no more homelessness, no more poverty. There's going to be no more because God is just and he will make everything right. Father, help us today to see the beauty and the majesty of who you are as a just God. God, I pray for those of us who are hurting today because we've had injustice carried out against us. And I'm asking God, by, by the power of your Spirit, you would come and minister deeply to the hearts and souls of people who find themselves in that place. That your Spirit would speak hope into their sense of hopelessness right now. Father, I pray for us as your church that you would help us to love justice as much as you do. That you would show us what it looks like to be people who seek justice in this world. In the name of Jesus. And God, I pray for anyone in this room who are, or who is watching online who does not know you in a personal way, who is not yet a follower and believer in Jesus. God, I pray that the reality that you are a just God would settle into their hearts. And I pray that the good news that you are a God who is merciful would breathe new life into their soul. That you, God, would call people May they hear your voice even now saying, come to me, receive forgiveness, and be made right. God, you are good. And we stand with saints throughout all the ages and the history of this planet and billions of people in this world even today, and we declare the goodness of a God who is just. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together and worship, church.
never fails me Cause all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will see of the good Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, if you are new here, I'd love to meet you. I'm going to be out in the first steps area in the lobby. I'd love to uh, say hi, so come on by and say hi. Church, as we go into our week, let me remind you of the God that you serve. He is the rock, and his work is perfect. All of his ways are justice. He is a God of faithfulness, and without iniquity, just and upright is he. God, as we go into the world, may we receive comfort and hope from the reality of who you are as a just God. Empower us, though, God, by your Spirit to go and be ambassadors of justice in the name of Jesus to a world that is broken and hurting in so many ways. May we together, wherever we go this week, be lights of hope and point people to the God who is just. In your name I pray. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a great week.